Hello and welcome to episode 21 of On Liberty, coming to you live from the Center for Independent Studies in Sydney, Australia. I'm your host, Salvatore Bavonis, and joining me today is Peter Curdy, Director of the Culture, Prosperity, and Civil Society Program at the Center for Independent Studies and Adjunct Associate Professor of Law at the University of Notre Dame. I'll be talking to Peter about cancel culture, ideological cleansing, and maybe the BBC proms. Peter Curdy, how are you? I'm well, thanks, Salvatore. It's great to be back in the chair. Oh, you actually, as everyone I'm sure knows, were our first guest on on Liberty. And if uh, if I can have any say about it, you'll be our last. Uh, if we ever have to end, we're going to end with you. It's you're the bookends. But thank well, you for 21 appearing. weeks ago. 21 yeah. weeks ago we started. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for appearing here in the middle. And of course, we're going to talk about your new CIS paper, Cancel, uh, which is about. I have to read the title. How Ideological Cleansing Threatens Australia. Ideological cleansing, what do you mean by that term? Well, I think this whole manifestation of cancel culture is an indication of increasing social division, that debates becoming harder, that um, that public discourse becomes a zero-sum game with either winners or losers. And what stands behind the whole art notion of cancel culture is the idea of sanctioning. You sanction, um, uh, you sanction an institution or a person or an historical figure because of something that they have done uh, or something that they represent that is deemed to be offensive and oppressive uh, to, uh, to, to vulnerable people. And so ideological cleansing is the idea that we remove all kind of any ideas or representations that as it were contaminate a, a pure vision of, uh, of who we think of ourselves as being. Yeah, you know, you're not the first person I've heard use switch to passive voice when talking about cancel culture. So you said, you know, is deemed offensive. Is deemed by whom? Well, that's a, a very good question. It, who, who, in do, who indeed does do the deeming? A lot of this is patrolled, I think, on, on social media. That's a first point, that people uh, are very vigilant on social media and quick to, to, to point out uh, the slightest fault or error and magnify that on social error. I think corporations also increasingly are keen to make sure that they don't step across a line and attract uh, criticism themselves. So I think there can be a corporate sense of deeming. But this is a very good question. And it goes to the heart of the problem, because once whoever it is uh, it, it, who patrols the, the ideological high ground, as it were, once that group of people or those warriors determine that something is offensive, it's very, very difficult to engage with them. And so we right. see a, a reduction, a diminishing of reason, debate, and and the sensible uh, and if, uh, and rational weighing of evidence. Who indeed? It, it, people, I think, find themselves uh, unexpectedly and rapidly vilified for having done something, and then they can't apologize for it. No amount of apology right. is sufficient to to redress the balance. Well, let me say some hellos to people. I hope we don't have to apologize to. That's John. Anthony, Elizabeth, David, thanks for watching today. Of course, we're going to get to questions in about 10 minutes. So if you have questions for Peter, start feeding them into the YouTube chat and we will get to them. Peter, I'm going to put you on the spot. We haven't rehearsed this. I want to add, I'm going to read a, an excerpt to you and just get your view of, you know, if you think this deserves to be canceled. I'm going to read, not sing. Land of hope and glory, mother of the free, how shall we extol thee who are born of thee? What's, what's so threatening about that? Why are well, people finding that offensive? Well, it's, a, it's arisen um, in the last few weeks. Uh, possibly it's been under, under consideration for months. You are, of course, referring to the, that well-known British institution, The Last Night of the Proms, which has been um, been taking place in, in London for over, well over 100 years now. And in fact, uh, a form of it is replicated here in Sydney by the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. And as part of the last night of the proms, which traditionally, as many people know, uh, involves a lot of flag waving and, and patriotic singing, there are two 
uh, two songs in particular, if I may use the word songs. One is Rural Britannia, the refrain of Rural Britannia, <clears throat> and the other is the, the, um, the, the, the song that you just quoted, Land of Hope and Glory, which is in fact a, a hymn. And I think that now there's been a, there's, suddenly there's been a sense that these two songs and the emblems that are part and parcel of the last night of the proms represent an unacceptable expression of patriotism, of national pride, um, and that it's time to dispense with these. And it's interesting that the people who have, have proposed this include the 35-year-old a young Finnish conductor who is who is going to be conducting the last night of the proms. And for her, it's understandable that she would not have a sense of, of Britishness in, in a way. I mean, how could she be expected to have that? I think what's more surprising, though, <clears throat> is the way in which the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, seems to have capitulated so quickly to these demands and to be prepared to set aside long-standing traditions for fear of being seen to be racist, nationalistic, oppressive, uh, marginalizing minorities and so on and so forth. So I think that it's arisen almost out of a, of a determination to eradicate anything that could be seen to, to smack of, uh, of an unsavory past. Right. Well, speaking of uh, an extravagant patriotism, I see you were wearing your Australia pin today. What, what motivated you to put that on? Well, it's funny you should point this out. This was given to me by one of our um, one of our long term supporters and a great supporter of the culture program. And coming in on the bus this morning, I, I it, it, the, the thought occurred to me because I I suspected you might be uh, raising the land of hope and glory issue. The last time <laughs> the problems, I just relieved you didn't ask me to sing. And I thought well, maybe I, I'll, maybe, wait, I didn't <clears throat> ask you to sing. You declined. Let me be clear. I, that is true. <laughs> um, but I, I thought, well, maybe I'll maybe I'll wear this little flag icon um, and see how that feels. It's the first time I've worn it. It's it's fresh out of the little plastic bag that it was it was presented to me in. Um, and so I thought I'd just give it an airing on the 21st edition of On Liberty. <laughs> well, thanks for thanks for honoring us with your honor for your country. I assume you are Australian. I am uh, indeed. I've been an Australian citizen since 1998. Oh, okay. Well, welcome. I, I'm certainly uh, only an American. I'm just a visitor here. Uh, look, in your paper, and I'm going to go back to the paper because that's really what we're talking about today. In your paper for the Center for Independent Studies, you suggest that cancel culture can, and, and there are three threats you pose, corrode civility, <coughs> destroy trust, and fuel discord. Let's try to unpack each of those in turn. So let's, let's start with corroding civility. I, I mean, is cancel culture corroding civility or is cancel culture just people legitimately expressing their own point of view in a free debate? Well, the free expression of opinion is not harmful at all. What the, the threat to civility arises <clears throat> because it because debate becomes increasingly difficult. And as I said in, in my opening remarks, we it, we live in an increasingly the danger is that we will live in an increasingly polarized society where civil discourse, the civil exchange of different points of view becomes very, very difficult. Um, and as that becomes more difficult, so civility by which I, I and when I use the phrase civility, I'm not talking about not putting your feet on the seats in buses or eating cheeseburgers on the train, although the way in which we conduct ourselves in public is a part of civility. But well, I'm using the term civility to talk about the way in which we live with difference in our very varied, open and free society, as it becomes harder to live with difference and as it becomes riskier to express a different point of view. So civility and with it tolerance becomes threatened and diminishes. Mm. And then you also say it will destroy trust. Now, uh, civility, I get. I, I mean, cancel culture is sadly seems to be all about incivility. But why would cancel culture erode trust in society? Because I think, and you see, these three dangers that we're going through are, in fact, linked. And we can look at them separately, but they need to be understood, as it were, as three parts of a three cords of a rope. Because once it becomes difficult or, or, or even impossible to exchange openly uh, different points of view, I think it becomes harder for us to trust one another. Because if I express to you my my candid opinion about something, I can't be sure that you're not going to um, 
shot me on Facebook or social media. And so uh, my sense of openness towards you, <clears throat> my sense of willingness to share of myself um, diminishes. And that's where I think we see an erosion of trust. Right. And then the, the third, I know you said these are all part of the same thing. You said it fuels discord in society. Look, this is something that I really am going to push back on. I mean, is discord in society a bad thing? I mean, I come from a country where discord is almost valued as a way of life. Uh, couldn't Australia use a little more discord sometimes? <laughs> well, that's a good point. I think that discord, I'm using discord in the most negative sense. I don't mean an absence of difference, uh, uh, an absence of the vociferous exchange of views. But I think uh, the, 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 the discord that I see um, threatening Australian society it arises from the fact that we become we can become increasingly polarized. We find it hard to engage with one another. We find it hard to trust one another. And so the fabric of the, 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 the social fabric starts to get strained. Of course, any open, liberal, democratic society is going to have elements of discord. And I think countries like the United States, the United Kingdom, the Australia have different levels of discord. The, it's in a sense, it's not the discord itself that's the problem. It's how we manage that discord. And I think as it becomes harder to manage discord, discord becomes harmful. Right. And there's an irony in your paper that cancel culture strikes me as often being very aggressive, very, you know, attack oriented and, and very intentionally hurtful. Yet you suggest in your paper that it's ultimately inspired by fragility and fear that you, you, you cite Jonathan Haidt, the co-founder of the Heterodox Academy, saying that it all starts on campus with uh, with the uh, with the students. And uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, the the uh, uh, the snowflake uh, epidemic on campus. I mean, how can a. a an ep a, a phenomenon of people feeling weak and fearful result in such aggressive attack behavior? Mm, uh, it's a good question because I think there are many paradoxes uh, around this, that, that campaigns that are, um, it, that are supposed to be about the pursuit of justice and about the, the, the pursuit of, of, of freedom and, and liberty actually become oppressive and that um, concerns for, for about fragility can manifest themselves in very, as you say, in very aggressive terms. So there are a, a lot of paradoxes. I mean, we can trace many of the uh, roots of, uh, of this current movement of cancel culture to critical race theory, which developed in the 1970s on American university campuses, which were concerned with addressing imbalances of power. Now, in a sense, that's very important. And I think we always need to be attentive to, to the, the distribution of power and to power imbalances in a democracy. Uh, that in itself is a good thing. Uh, but critical race theory has evolved into something that it now becomes oppressive rather than liberating. And so imbalances of power, perceived imbalances of power, become the pretext for, uh, for very oppressive and powerful behavior that represses uh, and, and does harm. So there are many paradoxes in this movement. And it's not, it's, it, what's important to note is not that, it, it's not that it, the, the motivation is bad. I mean, racial discrimination is a terrible thing. And happily, it's been unlawful in this country, in the United Kingdom, since the 1970s. And we know now it's socially and culturally unacceptable to discriminate against people on the grounds of, of skin color or gender. Uh, or sexual orientation, and these are good things. These are uh, these are widely accepted now in our society, and, and I welcome that. But as discriminate, discriminatory behavior or discriminatory language has become increasingly unacceptable, so paradoxically, it's become we've seen uh, we've, we're seeing restrictions on freedom of speech, on freedom, uh, particularly freedom of speech, I think, but freedom of association. We have to be very careful about what we say and do and with whom we mix. So there are many paradoxes in this. And I think the initial motivations were right. We don't want to see the vulnerable harmed. We don't want to see the oppressed oppressed. We don't, we want people to live uh, as, as fully and as live in, in, in as lively way 
um, and as meaningful a way as possible. What we mustn't do is overstep the mark, as it were, and embark upon what I've called ideological cleansing to pursue these objectives. Right. I, in your paper, you, you write about the statues toppling and of, of and you don't seem to be upset by statues to dictators toppling, the, the Saddam Hussein statue going down or busts of Marx and Lenin being removed. But then you seem to be more disturbed by, you know, a Macquarie or a Cook statue being defaced. Uh, is Aren't these just different manifestations in different societies of the same thing? I, I, what's the difference between you know, pulling down a, a Marx bust or defacing a Cook statue? That's a good question. I, I think in a way they are manifestations of the same thing, that same thing being the toppling of statues. But the difference is um, that I think when people are, when, for example, when the statues of Saddam Hussein were toppled, I think that represented a, a, um, a, a gesture of hope if I may put it in that way, that it was the marking the end of a brutal regime, the toppling of the statue represented um, an optimism about the future. And so I think those are understandable and, uh, and in a sense to be, to be welcomed. I mean, we don't have statues of Hitler in, uh, in Germany uh, now because I think there is a sense, I mean, there wouldn't be, but there's a sense in which of, of optimism towards the future. Now, the difference between that sort of statue toppling and the defacing of statues of Captain Cook here in Sydney is that I think it, mark, it, it represents a pessimism about the past. It's not about optimism at all. Uh, I mean, my, my critics would say, well, actually, there is an optimism because it's, there's an optimism about re reviewing and reconsidering Australian history. But I don't really accept that. I think that to deface statues of, of James Cook, who was active in the late 18th century uh, on the eastern seaboard of Australia, is actually simply to deny an important part of our history and to and is is an expression of pessimism, not an expression of hope. Topple a statue of a tyrant when the tyrant falls represents, I think, an optimism about tomorrow. Right. Let's start getting questions, and I see we have a few coming through already. Peter, I'm going to ask you uh, a bit of a stretch question as a final question before we go to viewer questions. And I'm going to ask you to put your, uh, your cassock and collar on for this one, because iconoclasm has a long history in the English speaking world, going right back to the Reformation and uh, maybe even uh, you know, at some points before that, if we want to go back in Christian history to the Byzantines. And you know, there's a lot of precedent for iconoclasm. Is that something that's just deeply ingrained in our culture and society and not particularly a new thing? Well, I think it is deeply ingrained and you're right. I mean, uh, I, the smashing of anything deemed unacceptable by those, uh, by those, as it were, rising to, to positions of authority is, not, is nothing new in, in human society. And you're right, there was a lot of icon iconoclasm uh, in the Reformation and, and earlier than that, in the centuries preceding that. Uh, when religious imagery deemed uh, unacceptable, blasphemous, uh, idolatrous, uh, wa was destroyed. It came to particular um, head in Britain, as you say, during the Reformation, right. when a lot was destroyed. The Puritans also uh, in, the, um, in, in the 17th century uh, destroyed anything that was deemed to be offensive. Um, so, yes, I, it seems to be something that human beings do. They, they, they seize on images that are now considered unacceptable and they tear them down. I think what the difference between the, the period of the Reformation and today is that you and I can sit here and talk about these things without fear that either of us will be hauled off to be burnt at the stake. That the hope. stakes, as it were, <laughs> were a lot higher right. in, in, the, in the 16th century during the Reformation. Right. Well, I do it, wonder. It does, you're right. I think it does seem to be it does seem to be a human trait. I wonder how whether it's human or if it's a reforming trait, because uh, I, I have to note that in Italy, there is still a statue to Benito Mussolini in Rome that has on it Mussolini Dukes. <laughs> and what's hilarious is that right after World War Two, uh, vandals removed the gold leaf from the statue. <laughs> so the gold is gone, but the statue is still there. 
we, we're going to go to questions in just a moment. I want to thank everyone for watching today. Of course, if you're not already a member of the Center for Independent Studies, please do join. There is a support link in the comments. And if you click on support, you'll have the option to join CIS. I think $40 will get you a membership and get you notifications of upcoming shows of On Liberty and that sort of thing. We'd love to have you as a member. If you're already a member and you can afford to make an additional contribution, of course, that helps keep us on the air because the more money we raise, the more members we bring in, the more we can justify pouring the resources into making this show happen. Uh, I'm not paid for this show. Peter has waived his customary speaker's fee, but, uh, <laughs> but we do have to pay the production people who make this possible. So if you're able to make a contribution, we do appreciate it. Of course, please, please press the like button. There are 32 of you watching and only 12 of you have liked the video. So I hope the other 20 like the video as well. Please do click that thumbs up and uh, we appreciate it. Also hit the subscribe button. You'll get notifications of our future shows. Peter, I'm going to start off with a question and I've lost it here. It was from Elizabeth. There we go. Um, she says we should, well, she has a comment, not a question, but I'm gonna turn it into a question for you anyway. Uh, she's saying we're getting lots of hyperbolic twaddle from her word, <laughs> that's a fantastic word, from The Guardian about the proms. Uh, to put a stop to the jingoistic and offensive farang farango, farago, sorry, of the last night. Do you think the proms are jingoistic or do you view it more as almost self-deprecatory? It's a very interesting question. Um, I don't think it's jingoistic, um, but I don't think it is self deprecatory either. I think it, there is a sense in which the last night of the proms allows people to let their hair down and have some fun. And they have it. They have this fun by waving Union Jacks and by singing um, British songs. When I was following, looking into the story a bit, and there was footage from previous last nights of the proms um, and photographs, I was struck by the, the makeup of the audience. It's not all uh, white elderly British people who take, take part in, in, the, in, in, the, in, in the celebration, for want of a better word, the, the, con the final concert. It's a very mixed audience because it's an institution and people want to be part of it and have some fun. And being having that fun uh, involves waving flags and singing songs. It's a bit like Fourth uh, of July celebrations. Um, the, the American Independence Day celebrations have now become a worldwide thing in many Western countries at any rate. And people who are, have no particular affiliation or allegiance with the United States, uh, people from all kinds of backgrounds, have a sense, I think, in which they can enjoy this celebration. They can have some fun. They can wave American flags and eat American food. I don't think it's any more jingoistic than, than, than that. I think it's a celebration of something that's just enjoyable to participate in. I, I had no idea anyone was eating hot dogs and waving American flags outside of the United States. So I'm glad to hear they it. are indeed. They are indeed. <laughs> we, have, uh, we have a question from someone known only as Plant Grinder. Uh, Plant wants to know, uh, what do you think is the antidote to cancel culture? Your paper is a fantastic indictment. What's the solution? That's a, a good question, because I don't think there is a solution as such that if we do this, then this then that will happen. But I do think that we need to be willing to talk about it. We need to call out practices and behaviors that are oppressive, that are harmful, that are vindictive, that do damage to people. Um, and I think we need to reclaim the, the freedoms that are, go to the heart of our life together in a secular liberal democracy, which is what Australia is. So it's not a solution as such, but I think we can change, we can reclaim the ground. We can begin to reclaim the ground by talking about it and by, by calling out behavior that is, that, well, behavior that's unacceptable and that many people do not feel able to call out for fear of vilification. I've been criticized for the things that I have said in this report. I've been branded as a, as a, as a flag waving patriot who says unacceptable things by, by some critics. Well, that's fine. And I'm, I'm ready. I'm prepared to be criticized. And it goes with, with the turf when you work in a think tank. There are many people who are not prepared and not, don't feel able to do that. 
And so I speak on behalf of them and claim, claim uh, I want to encourage them to, 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 be, to speak out. I want to claim the freedom that all of us enjoy to express different points of view. So I think the answer is reclaim, reclaim freedom, reclaim our liberty and restore our confidence. David worries that the world's history is being graywashed in front of our very eyes. Now, I assume he means that uh, middle-aged white men in suits and ties with gray hair are changing history. But in case he doesn't, <laughs> he's worried that about graywashing of history. He wants to know, how can we stop this happening in a woke education system? Um, Professor Simon Heffer, the uh, distinguished British uh, columnist and academic, wrote a paper recently for the Center for Independent Studies, an essay called Moral Terror, and in which, in the course of that, Simon makes a very good case for education. And I think that if we are going to uh, correct uh, inaccuracies in historical interpretation, if we are going to reverse this process of greywashing, surely it begins in the classroom. It begins with teaching children the, the skills of historical evaluation. It, t it begins with teaching them the ability to weigh evidence, to weigh arguments, and to discern falsehood from truth. When the teaching of history becomes an exercise in promoting propaganda, we're sunk. We're not going to get anywhere because there will be one acceptable view that can never be debated. We know that that is not how history works. That's not how historians need to do their work. So I think let's begin in the classroom with the way in which we teach children and young people about the task of approaching and interpreting our history. Right. Now, Elizabeth says, what annoys you makes you stronger. I'm all with you, Elizabeth. <laughs> Anthony, uh, though, wants to ask a question. He, he says, isn't cancel culture in Australia an extreme and violent form of the cultural cringe that so preoccupied Australian intellectuals since the turn of the last century? It's an interesting question. I don't know, really. I've never quite understood, as a, as a newcomer to these shores, I've never quite understood the cultural cringe, but maybe that's because I come from the country which Australia is deemed to cringe towards, that is to say the United Kingdom. I don't, it, it could be. I think it's a very interesting question that Anthony asks. It, it could be. I'm not entirely sure that it is, but, but feelings of, so certainly I think that there is a feeling of not wanting to be left out or left behind in contemporary movements such as cancel culture uh, that can impel many people to participate and a sense that that we too have to share in the fighting of injustice i don't know whether it's it's can be so closely associated with mm -hmm. with with the cultural cringe i'd be interested to hear what others might think about that well if you do have a comment on cultural cringe feed it in the comments and we'll try to get to it in this uh, question and answer session uh, John wants to ask what I think is going to be a controversial question. At least it's about a very controversial figure. It's about Lauren Southern. Now, I don't know if you follow Lauren Southern at all or you know her. She's a uh, very controversial figure, often uh, often labeled as a white nationalist. I don't know if she uses that label herself. I, I don't follow her personally, but I do know that she's extraordinarily controversial. Uh he points out that she ca challenged cancel culture by giving an appearance, uh, giving a speech on the Melbourne University campus. And people, as she went by, were yelling, kill Lauren Southern. Uh, now, I don't think anyone actually believed they were going to kill her. But when you start using that kind of language, well, what does that mean? I mean, should... Should police be stepping in? Uh, what I mean, how far is too far when it comes to this cancel culture? Well, I think using that kind of language is uh, going too far because whether or not one actually intends to kill somebody, using the using that the word "kill" in that imperative sense, I think uh, can evoke real feelings of of violence, and it becomes it can become gradually acceptable. And the idea that somebody can be killed becomes gradually acceptable. But what I think is extraordinary about these things, and I don't, I don't follow Lauren Southern either, but what's extraordinary about these sorts of things is that they, are, they take place on, on university campuses. Now, for sure, university campuses, certainly when I was at university in the, uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, really, uh, there were, in Britain, 
there were a lot of protests about all kinds of things. There were left-wing protests about the Thatcher government. Uh, for example, there were protests about nuclear disarmament. So university campuses are not are the place where, in many ways, young people discovering their identity for themselves, discovering their political points of view, can protest and do so legitimately. But when university campuses become the place where different points of view are silenced, mm -hmm. or those who profess to hold different points of view are attacked or vilified, then I think it's completely, it's completely inimical to what the spirit of the university ought to be. It's not that you can't protest on a university, but you've got to allow people who disagree with you to protest and to express their points of view. So when somebody comes onto a university campus and they're met with cries of kill, I think that shows that we have got a real problem uh, at the heart of, uh, of university life. Right. Anthony has a comment that I want to turn into a question. Uh, he is suggesting something that I've heard many people mention that uh, cancel culture recalls the red guards of the cultural revolution in China, people who want to return us to a year zero. Uh, they might also recall the French Revolution and the Jacobins. Do you think that uh, that comparison is meaningful? Uh, I think it's, it's an interesting comparison. It doesn't go quite... Um, I mean, the, the, the red China and the, the years of the French Revolution were very serious because people paid for errors with their, with their lives and, in, and, and many people perished for expressing um, different points of view or simply for being considered to hold different points of view or to represent different points of view. We're not seeing people being hauled through the streets of Sydney in tumbrils towards a guillotine. Um, nor are people being purged and sent off to imprisonment camps for re-education. So we're not seeing anything as bad as that. But nonetheless, I think there is an interesting parallel because if somebody expresses a different point of view, they are rapidly or can rapidly be vilified on social media and they can find themselves ostracized and isolated and forced from positions. So lively, people can lose their livelihoods, they can lose their professional reputation. Well, in 21st century Australia, that can be, that's pretty serious. Lose your job, all kinds of things go with losing your job. You can lose your home. If you lose your standing in society, you lose your reputation. Those become things that are very hard to recover. So I think what's common to all these instances is the, is the, is the, the, the promulgation of fear and people are cowed out of fear to behave in a certain kind of way to conform. Right. Now, cancel culture has uh, kind of merged in the last few months with the Black Lives Matter movement to become a very, you know, uh, almost like a uh, inextricable, uh, you know, in intertwined ball of knots that, that it's hard to pull the two apart. We have a, a comment that I want, again, I want to turn to a question from Ross, which is about the idea of race and the role of race in cancel culture. Uh, when I have taught race and ethnicity, I mean, I'm a sociology professor. I, I teach classes in sociology. And when I've taught race, I've taught that there's really no such thing as race. We perceive race, but in fact, there's a continuum of skin colors. Skin color is not that directly related to uh, genetics that, uh, you know, while there are some broad racial differences, in fact, you know, I mean, my parenthood is partly from Sicily, meaning that I certainly have uh, people from Africa who've contributed to my own genetics. You know, race is something that's become very mixed. I, I love to point out to people, Queen Elizabeth herself is descended from the Prophet Muhammad and Genghis Khan. <laughs> so, the, you know, what is race in a situation like that? Um, but he wants to ask, it, it, does race, if race is just a matter of amount of melanin in the skin, um, should we be so focused on it? What role should it play in our societies? Well, race has been, however one understands it and, and defines it, and I, I think you make some really important points, uh, Salvatore, in those remarks, but race has been considered to be the basis for um, unacceptable discriminatory practices, those practices were called out and became unacceptable. And though a, a change of behavior was underscored by a change in the law. 
so we know that whether or not we have questions about race, we all know what the idea of discriminating against someone on the grounds of race means. We know what racial discrimination means, even though we might argue about the details and we might we, we might have differences of opinion about about how race is to be defined. It's it's a it's a concept that we get and we understand. And and right in my view, right thinking people do not behave in discriminatory ways. They do not behave towards uh, neighbors. They do not discriminate uh, towards in their behavior towards people on the basis of perceived um, differences of of race. I think that it, we. I, I think that we have come to understand differences in race in terms of power. And I think what lies at the heart of movements like Black Lives Matter is, as I mentioned earlier, imbalances of power. So we have in the United States the perception of white cops shooting black men. Mm -hmm. But we know that not all cops are white and that, I mean, to so I don't want to repeat all those points that you made about about uh, about the mixture that all of us carry in our genetic makeup. But I think these are seen as being about perceived imbalances of power. And what Black Lives Matter sought to do, apparently, was to address those imbalances. Where I think they have merged, Black Lives Matter has, has started to merge with cancel culture, is that um, perceptions of power imbalances have turned into an assault. Not, it, it, so it's not just concerned with correcting police behavior, but actually overturning anything that represents um, all institutions that represent or held to represent imbalances of power. This is a slightly long answer to, to that point. But I think that's, that's where we get caught up with racial discrimination in this matter, that it's about power rather than about skin color itself. Right. Now, David has explained that when he said graywash, that was a, a pun on or a play on a blend between whitewashing and Black Lives Matter. So now, so now we oh, know he wasn't okay. he wasn't talking about us uh, uh, setting history, about us. but I, I didn't I didn't think he was. Uh, look, Anthony wants to ask about multiculturalism, and he threw the question out there: Is multiculturalism compatible with with freedom, or I, w I might say, with individual liberty? Because then he follows up, does multiculturalism promote the consideration of people not as individuals, but as members of groups leading to identity politics in which group privileges take precedent over individual rights? I like to make a distinction between two forms of multiculturalism. On the one hand, there's soft multiculturalism, by which I mean the easygoing, mixing of people on the streets, in society, in the workplace, on public transport that we see every day uh, in Australian citizen and on Australian seats and then, uh, streets. And there's an easygoing acceptance that marks, I think, that's, a, that's an important characteristic of Australian society. We accept other, one another, we are open to one another, and we don't make judgments about um, about others on the basis of where they come from or what they what they look like. To that extent, I think Australia is a very successful, uh, a very um, comfortable and a very tolerant multicultural society. So that's soft multiculturalism. And in fact, you could just say, well, that's just the Australian lifestyle. Right. On the other hand, I contrast that with what I call hard multiculturalism, which picks up some of these things that Anthony is talking about, where differences are enforced and People are identified not just as individuals, but as members of groups. And the rights of groups are asserted over against the rights of other groups. And that's where, to use the phrase that Anthony raised, that's where this idea of identity politics comes, where it's the identity of the group rather than the individual. And when we get hard multiculturalism that is enforced, I think we do see a threat to freedom because it come, becomes are uh, hard for the, 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 the different the rights of one group to be balanced against the rights of another. That becomes problematic. But soft multiculturalism, I think, is a, a, a wonderful feature of Australian life. And long may it continue to be so. Well, does one perhaps uh, transition over time into the other? So, David, 
uh, raises the point that he remembers a time in Melbourne when Greeks and Italians were seen as culturally different. Now, I'm, of course, half Greek and half Italian myself, although all American. Uh, he says now Greeks and Italians are a, a much loved and accepted uh, part of the you know, color of our country. Even the accent has become accepted. Um, is the same thing likely to happen to other groups? That is, is multiculturalism a continually advancing or receding, depending on the way you want to think of it, fringe? And behind it is always this acceptance and society moves on. My answer to that question is an unequivocal yes. I think hard multiculturalism is something that has a political agenda and it's pushed by, by as it were, to use the, lo the loosest, in the loosest sense, pushed by organized groups who have, a, have an interest and want to promote a certain kind of agenda. So I think we will see that, it, it, that increase. And as in, uh, it, the, the, the more reluctant we are to challenge identity politics, the more we're going to see hard multiculturalism, um, as it were, T tighten its grip on our on our society. But in the course of doing my work, I've spoke to many people who said that in a way, this was just the way in which Australian society works. And they cited the example of uh, Greek and Italian migrants in the in the mid years of the 20th century. And gradually people win acceptance and said this will happen. This will happen to new groups as they come and they establish themselves. They show themselves to be um, to be committed to living in Australia and to making uh, a, a, making a, a, a life in Australia and to contributing in positive ways to Australian society. I have no doubt that, that we will see that continue to happen. Um, and I've always said, I think that, for example, people who are critical of Muslim women who want to wear the hijab or want to ban the hijab are acting in a very illiberal way because if that if wearing the hijab is an important thing for a Muslim woman to do, and I know we often get taught, we often talk about this being an oppressive gesture that is enforced upon uh, upon women, but that's not entirely true because there are many Muslim women who actually do choose and want to choose uh, and choose freely to wear to wear this kind of vesture. Now, that's something. The acceptance of that, I think, is something that needs to that does run deep in Australian society. And an acceptance that we need to cultivate. And I think that what we look for is a willingness to embrace everything that Australia has to offer. We don't look for any other kind of conformity. So I'm con I'm certain that uh, that as generations become, uh, as time moves on, to use a rather hackneyed phrase, we will see increasingly um, the, the 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 acceptance of people who might be uh, who might be who might say that they find acceptance at the moment harder. Right. Now, we're going to have to wrap up uh, in just a moment. I will remind everyone that we are talking about your paper, uh, Cancelled, uh, How I have to how Ideological Cleansing Threatens Australia. That is available on the CIS website. Uh, you can download it. There's a PDF there and I uh, hope you'll enjoy, people will enjoy reading it. I do want to ask you one last question prompted by your paper. Now, a lot of these debates tend to focus on what's happening on university campuses. I myself, of course, work on a university campus, and my experience has been that campus life is pretty workaday. That, that is, we're not having these, you know, grand debates and big protest marches. And yeah, yeah, there are flyers up that may condemn this or condemn that, but pretty mm -hmm. much life at universities just goes on. Do you think perhaps there's too much focus on universities as this, you know, uniquely threatening institution in society? Or, or do you think universities play a much more central role than perhaps I believe? Well, I think it's quite possible that the the um, the threat, as it were, is is overplayed because, as we know, um, media and social media pick up on small instances, on localized instances, and universalize them. So that something that happens, say, on the campus of the University of Sydney suddenly becomes something that we are expected to see or we want to look for on every other university campus. So I think that, it, you know, in some ways, it, it, we, we, our, our media and our approach to news means that we tend to universalize um, the local. But I think universities do have a, play a very important part in, in the life of our country. And we educate generations of future leaders, whether in commerce or politics or industry and science. And we need to, we want 
I think we want to see our graduates, all of our graduates, uh, emerge with um, a, a balanced education. In this, and I don't, when I say balanced, I mean that they have the capacity to, to exercise w- reason and to evaluate evidence and to make reasoned decisions and to discern f- truth from falsehood. So I think universities are very important, but I think concerns about freedom uh, or, uh, of speech, for example, on universities need not to be universalized. I don't think it's, it's characters of every, the life of every student on every campus. But we need to be attentive to the fact that these things are happening. And as we touched on earlier, that it's on university campuses that we want to see the exchange, the free exchange of different points of view, and not to eradicate the free exchange. Great. Peter Curdy, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Salvatore. Great. And thanks also to our producer, Emily Holmes, our executive producer, Max Hawk Weaver. The director of the CIS is Tom Switzer. And next week on On Liberty, Dr. Chin Jin, president of the Federation for Democratic China. Hope to see you then. Thanks, everyone.